Today's show is sponsored by Divi Cloud. Divi Cloud protects cloud and container environments from policy violations, threats, IAM challenges, and misconfigurations. Types of misconfigurations that have cost enterprises a jaw-dropping $5 trillion over the last two years. Divi Cloud provides continuous security and compliance across all cloud service providers and containers, including AWS, GCP, Azure, Alibaba, and Kubernetes, providing a comprehensive view of what's in your cloud, along with the tools and automation you need to manage it today. Divi Cloud is proving that security and innovation are not mutually exclusive, one customer at a time. Join innovative enterprises like Spotify, Fannie Mae, and Discovery, who have found the freedom to innovate securely without loss of control. To learn more, visit divicloud.com forward slash cloudcast. That's D-I-V-V-Y-C-L-O-U-D dot com slash cloudcast to sign up for a free trial. Divi Cloud. Find your freedom to innovate. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hope everybody is doing well. We are now into September. We are almost the end of the third quarter, if you will, of 2020. It's been quite a year, as all of you know. Uh, we are still in quarantine in much of the world, but uh, hope everybody is staying safe. Hope everybody's socially distancing, wearing a mask, washing your hands, and and most importantly, hopefully you're you know you're kind of watching out for for your friends, for your colleagues, for your neighbors. You know, go out there, take care of each other, folks. That um, we are we're all in this together, and uh, hopefully we can come out of it sooner than later. So. There were a few interesting things in Cloud News of the Week that we put in the show notes around some new features, some new things announced by some of the cloud providers that are, you know, sort of interesting. But we thought we would spend the bulk of today's Cloud News of the Week talking about TikTok. Uh, The big news is that the U.S. division of TikTok is up for sale. Uh, There is supposed to be a decision made on who they're going to sell to. It's sort of being driven by the U.S. government. And uh, it's really up between two big cloud providers, Oracle and Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft is uh, rumored to be jointly bidding with Walmart, who is not a cloud provider, but, um, you know, they're in the bidding. So we thought what we would do is we would, uh, for this very important topic, which is incredibly important to teens and uh, teens' parents and people trying to learn dances, we thought we would spend exactly as much time as needed to really dig into this, really analyze it, give it the exact amount of time it needs for its importance in the cloud world. So let's dig into it. All right, and with that, we feel like we've given it exactly the amount of time and words uh, to dig into how important it is to the cloud world. So with that, uh, we're going to get into our conversation with the good folks from Microsoft. We're going to talk a little bit about migrating to the cloud. What does it mean? How do you do it? What are the best practices? And what are some of the tips and tricks to avoid? So we're going to get to that right after the break. Today's show is sponsored by Datadog, a cloud-scale monitoring platform that unifies metrics, logs, and traces from technologies like Istio, AppMesh, and Envoy. Plus, Datadog's service map automatically plots out the dependencies in your microservices architectures for seamless, context-rich troubleshooting. With rich visualizations, algorithmic alerting, and more than 250 vendor-supported integrations, Datadog allows you to monitor your distributed applications in real time. Start a free 14-day trial today by visiting datadog.com slash cloudcast, and Datadog will send you a great free t-shirt. That's datadog.com slash cloudcast. And we're back. And folks, you know, one of the biggest things that we've been seeing, especially as uh, we've been all suffering through the pandemic and, and ultimately kind of going through changes in, in how we work, how our businesses work is, um, you know, we've been seeing this kind of ongoing shift to more and more usage of public cloud, whether that is, uh, you know, the, the sort of IaaS clouds that we think about or SaaS offerings or, you know, even managed VDI offerings. We're seeing more and more kind of rapid adoption of the public cloud. And, and obviously, you know, it's tougher to get into our data centers. Uh, we're, we're seeing different economic models that businesses are having to deal with. And so we thought, you know, let's let's dive into what moving to the cloud or really migration to the cloud looks like. And we thought, well, what better way to do that than to really dive in with uh, one of the really big clouds that are out there that's been doing this for a long time. Excited to have Jeremy Winter, who is Director of Azure Management at Microsoft. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Yeah, hey, it's great to be here, Brian. Thanks for having me. Uh, Yeah, no, it's great to have you on. Um, You know, You've been working in this space for for a while. You've been doing a lot of very, very cool things at Microsoft. Before we dive into migrations and all, give us a little bit of background on some of the things that you work on and and then give us, you know, a little bit of, you know, how, because you've been at Microsoft long enough that you've been through this transition of, you know, kind of 
world's largest software company to now one of the world's largest cloud companies, you know, kind of talk about, you know, both your yeah. background, but also how you've gone through that transition. Yeah. So, on the, you know, the, the, the management front in Azure, uh, you know, my role really is pretty broad. It's, it's really focused on leading the, the management investments across the, across the cloud and, and well, really for across Azure. Now, interesting enough, migration and management go hand in hand, which is how I became and started to do, and my team started to do the development of the migration tools. But when you think of the management space, it really is things like uh, the ARM Azure Resource Manager and this entire control plane that we have in front of Azure. Uh, and that really helps all the all of our services that plug into it and our customers when you want to do deployments or script against Azure or just have a common identity and common tagging. So kind of the core platform. My teams also have the portal. So we build the Azure portal and the portal framework. So all the user experience across it, but we don't stop just the portal PowerShell and the cloud shell. Those are all part of my management teams and, uh, uh, you know, and then other management things like patch management, site recovery, Azure site recovery. So it's pretty broad, but on the migration front, you know, this really was an area that we felt, it was really important to start to get after in the tooling front. So a lot of the management and uh, migration, they were so close that we then just extended to just start focusing on the migration tools to help people just make it easier to get to the cloud. Yeah. So, no. Yeah. yeah I, no, like I, I said, broad, broad, Brian, it's a broad space. But. Yeah, no, that's, that's very cool. I, I mean, I, I, I'm glad to hear that you're sort of talking about, Hey, we, we really had to, to, you know, get this tooling in place, kind of frameworks in place. Cause you know, migrations, if, if left alone to, to people's, you know, kind of uh, whims, too often people want to bring, you know, kind of the previous habits, the previous process, kind of the previous ways they have done things. The cloud's a different place, right? It, you know, as, as much as we may want to make it consistent with the data center, it's it, it works differently. Um, so when people talk about migration, so as you're kind of having these conversations, is there a... Is there a framework that you always start conversations with to kind of get people in the right way of thinking about, you know, this movement, what it means not only as a technology change, but also uh, maybe a people and process change? Is there kind of a framework you use to uh, to start off the conversation or to kind of keep this conversation, uh, you know, from getting out of hand? Yeah, there is for sure a framework that we use. And I think, you know, it, what we really found, ironic, you know, it's pretty straightforward, but you know, each company or customer, they really have a, a, a dynamic approach that really just needs to fit their needs. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting. Every time I walk into a customer to help them or I get pulled in to meet with some of the executives or some of the IT leaders to talk about this migration concept, we usually just a little bit take a step back and just listen, uh, see what's needed from their perspective before we just dive in on, a, you know, hey, here's how you do it, because everyone has a bit of a unique angle from it for sure. Um, but I would say, you know, we do have a framework that is tried and true that started to go work through it. It really sits down from, you know, depending on the approach that people are taking, but it usually starts um, with something pretty straightforward of an assessment and a discovery. What really helps you understand what what's in the environment. And really, that's a key step that I, I, I find people often want to rush. But why that's so important, Brian, is that it actually helps people understand not only what they have, but what's the dependencies. And it helps them start to see, if we look at things like performance characteristics, you might actually be able to not just do an apples to apple transition to the cloud, but actually go look at what the right workload is, say on Azure, uh, so that then you can be optimized, whether it's from tech or finance side. But really, that's kind of the step. Then we move into, I know I'm getting a little long-winded, but you know, then we move into just the migration process itself. And that's where I think some of the other tooling really start to help. And that's, that's just moving those services um, back and forth, uh, you know, to from one environment to, to the cloud. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. I, no, and this is a, this is a topic that I think, like you said, everybody has kind of a different thing. So, you know, being long winded is, 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 is yeah. fine. <laughs> it's not, not well, long winded yeah. by any means. It, it, this it, it's just you know you look at the customers and there's times where some are looking at it from a modernization point of view yep others are looking at it from say boy i just need the advantages with agility and cost um and then we see others that are coming knocking on the door like hey look this data center is starting to expire we just did an acquisition and we have this other company's you know, environment we don't want to deal with it at all 
let's just let's just start to go ahead to the cloud. And it's a mashup of that for sure. I'd say that we built that framework across. Do you know another? I'd say it, it really does start from thinking about that business strategy. And that's kind of where I was headed on why it's so different. And you need to listen to the customer. You know, I like to listen and the teams listen to the customers and really just get a sense of where you're at. Uh, so it's best fit your need. And then from once that business strategy set out, and that's really for the customer as well. Like As you're thinking about your migrations, you really want to think about that broader business strategy. Then once you put your project plan together, you start down this path, the set, you know, assessment, discovery, the migration process itself, thinking about later as you as you look at this, don't forget, look out on the horizon of what you need to do once you get there, which is hence why that management and migration went so hand in hand with with the work we were doing, because then you move into this notion of well, what's my environment look like? How do I want to run the operations? What about security and compliance? And so those are those are things we like to think about. And of course, we have a framework and actually full teams to help our customers get through that. Um, but that's kind of some of the nine, nine or so things that I think about when I'm there is just, you know, these key areas. Yeah, no, I, that's good. And I, I actually I was I was curious, you know, because when you started saying, hey, look, we, we really have to listen because, like, you know, people are, are fairly unique. Obviously, you have some from frameworks to get them moving, depending on what they talk about. Have you yeah, seen a, have, sure. you, have you seen any shifts? You know, kind of, uh, you know, maybe material shifts in terms of why people are thinking about their migrations these days. I mean, you know, was it previously maybe they thought it was cost driven and it's and it's shifting towards more agility? Or are you seeing any kind of shifts in that sense of it, you know it's shifting the way that yeah. you you now have to think about uh, working on things, building things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've seen shifts in the last three years for sure where um, and then I've seen a shift Brian just in the last three, four months. And I think they're very, very interesting to look at it from the say the last three years, it started, I'd say very early on, there were you know, individual businesses or the developer that was, you know, out in front um, starting to go leverage the cloud technologies really started to go, lead the way and you saw smaller smaller pockets and organizations really looking to go justify and create the the opportunity to move to the cloud uh, and then i'd say over the course of the last year it did become more of a mainstream uh, an area that you could see the executive leadership really starting to make sure this is a part of their their cloud strategy and you could see every team starting to look or most customers uh were really looking at how they became the the you know, modernization in cloud is a key part of their business. Yeah. But we did something pretty interesting. I know you mentioned the, you know, yeah, you know, everyone has to think through and has been, in, is impacted by the course of the last six months for sure on just some of the global crisis, both from an economy and a health perspective. Boy, we did uh, in April, uh, our teams went and we just did call downs to our customers just to really get a sense of how and what was out on the horizon in a, in a in an era ahead of us and it was pretty eye-opening and pretty interesting just to learn how cloud was still in the game and still a key piece and clearly we see that as everyone turns to the cloud but cloud became an essential and you could see it um as in in all the conversations whether i hit financial industry we hit the financial industry and one of the conversations we had was just the data center wasn't about it was expiring and want to get out. The conversation had shifted to, we need to address this fragility in that data center. Like physical access just can't access. Staff and vendors, we don't have them or we're not going to have them. And so how do we start to go look at a way where we can keep empowering our business, but I don't have access to the data center. It had nothing to do with the facility itself per se on the actual, whether it was expiring or too big or getting out of date, it was how do you just do business in a world where you may not be able to do it in person? Yep. And so even the data center drove. Um, we saw others like, uh, so that's one, I say it's just resiliency is a big one. We saw others really looking at it from a perspective of um, getting out ahead and really trying to modernize. We saw some of the gaming, you know, some of the gaming industries and the entertainment industries, you know, leveraging the downtime to get out ahead of work that they knew they need to do as as they knew business or as they expect as business would turn back. 
So they were using that as a way to get out in front uh, clearly. Uh, ironically, I am seeing now more, even more so. We just did a we just did a few uh, blogs on it. It's been high interest of the CFO and the CTO coming together. I used to be pretty excited when I'd see security, IT, and the development teams at the table with us all talking through that. I mean, that's the magic when you can bring security, IT, and dev together. That's what we've all been wanting. Um, and I, you know, but now it's even interesting. We've been. I've, we just did a just did a review with a, a customer and. We've seen this up time and time again. The CFOs right at the table, and uh, that's a pretty interesting, uh, you know, just change in course that's happening. But clearly, I, I'm pretty excited. I mean, this is what we've been building for at the enterprise level with Azure, and it's really it's it's just the acceleration over the course of the last six months has been incredible. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. And I, actually, I was I was curious. Um, you know, are you seeing like who tends to who tends to drive migrations? You know, with, within an organization, does it does it tend to sort of come top down? Like you said, it's you know it's being driven by by the CFO and being driven by kind of financial pressures, or are you seeing it um, you know driven by application teams that you know maybe they're maybe they're frustrated with their uh, you know central IT organization, they're not able to get infrastructure resources fast enough. Is it do you, do you find there's there's kind of patterns that that tend to happen, or is it is it kind of all over the place because everybody you know everybody now sort of touches technology? Yeah, I'd say uh, it's starting to become more of a corporate initiative, mm, okay. almost tops down to the point I've even seen companies. You know, we get to work with a lot of a lot of a lot of the customers, and uh, they are. We've even seen significant shifts in leadership. Uh, if they aren't bought in and moving towards the cloud. And so we're seeing those changes occur. So it really becomes, I think, Brian, I'm seeing this as a more of a corporate initiative at this point. I definitely, I'd say, you know, we talked about this history that it's gone through. You know, our app developers really were driving a lot and some of that frustration with IT and just uh, all the acts, all the additional approval and the time it took to get things definitely was an early one. Uh, but now it really is, I think, tops down. Um, I say it is a corporate initiative that is really starting to be centered on um, more efficiency, not from a cost total perspective. That's there, but it isn't the leading piece. It's really more uh, from an agility and a resiliency point of view and uh, starting to just go you know, protect the business as they start to modernize. And this point on modernization for me is um, a key one just – we're seeing this notion of how do I bring my my practices, my technologies, the 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 workforce, how do I bring them forward in this new modern way as we start to see a you know infrastructures code and CI CD DevOps world really become real. And uh, so they're looking to go that direction. Yeah, interesting, interesting. I want to dive uh, a little bit into kind of some some implementation things, a, a little bit of the technical details. You know, I, I feel like, um, you know, most companies, if if you talk about, you know, hey, we're going to move to the cloud, they they kind of get it because they know what the cloud does, and then you get into this this challenge of, well, what do we do in between, right? We we've got an application, say, running in our data center, and then we'd like it to be running in the cloud. I have to imagine, sort of, you know, testing and transition plans are a big deal. Yeah. How do you help customers through those things so that they, they you know? They know that it's gonna it's gonna work, you know, now and then when they flip the switch and and the new version of it's running in the cloud. Yeah, for sure. Um, and remind me to come back to a skilling point. Well, if okay. I get if, if we get in that too much, because I think skilling is a key piece to this. But you know, technically, when you think about it, let's say we've done the discovery and assessment, we've worked our way through that this is the specific app workloads that or that workloads or apps that we want. Um, Typically, what we're seeing at that point is teams will go through best practice wise, go through and really understand the performance of it. Uh, make sure that you're looking at the technical dependencies, other code base that the, that the system is sitting in. Do they have access to the code or not? Uh, looking at compatibility, you start to go look at compatibility between the, the target cloud and making sure that that app will be able to run effectively there. And so to do that, we'll analyze the the specific binaries that are there, we're looking at the code and we're, we're looking at the performance characteristics. Once that's happened, we typically will 
see teams test in a small way, of, we'll, I'll call it in this scenario, failover, where you know they're looking at how do they leverage our tech and then it just fails over onto the cloud. But they're doing it in a, you know, there's no traffic to it, except maybe their test harnesses. They're really just looking at the characteristics of how, how, how it's running on the cloud. But what's happening at the same time there is you're, you're also looking at and getting familiar with the cloud, the, you know, the, the approach as it starts to get onto the cloud and, and confident that the workload runs well on the cloud. And that's really just, I'd say that initial step. Once what we find there is it, it's iterative. I try to always suggest, don't try to do everything at once. Let's just start with one and learn from it, get comfortable, and then you'll see things really start to unfold quickly once you're once you're comfortable with it and you're comfortable with the workloads. There's at that time also there's a lot of work that we'll we'll do looking at those workloads to make sure you've got the right uh, you know the right machines or the right compute identified on the on the target cloud with Azure. Oftentimes we've seen just because you're running one type of workload and it's using this type of memory and and RAM and storage uh, and your performance characteristic characteristics that you think are in the physical environment or in that virtualized environment on prem, it's not the it's not the case. They're awfully underutilized, or you could actually put put them on a different type of workload and save a bunch of money and actually reduce the footprint of what you have to manage. Uh, even if it's not reducing, say, money, you know, dollars for dollars for operating, but you're you're saving dollars for dollars. Um, you're going to save those dollars as you make your environment smaller, mm-hmm. so just less damage. Yeah. Once that's done, and we we I'll just say once you you kind of go through that, then it's relatively straightforward. Right? We've seen uh, we worked with the uh, we worked with one customer where we moved together. We moved about a thousand machines out of their out of their environment over a weekend, and uh, you know we had spent a few weeks ahead of time doing this process, and then we worked with them. I had you know, my teams were on call just like theirs were, uh, and we we did it together and just made sure everything was running the way they wanted. Their customers came over, and uh, so yeah, that's kind of I think some of the approach that we take. And this is just that's just. You know, my, my migration and it, it, that's just getting the workloads to the cloud. Yeah. Now, now we have, we have, and we've seen some though, Brian, that have used the tools that you just come in, do the assessment, you can identify them quickly, start using the tools, and within a few hours, you can have them up and running on the cloud. Gotcha. Uh, so I don't mean to scare everyone that, hey, this is a long thing. I think you just want to be smart about it. Um, but we do have, and other, other cloud providers do as well. And, uh, but we within Azure have a ton of a ton of tools that we will you know really help make it easy to move your whether it's your databases or your servers and uh, Linux or Windows will help you move them over. Yeah, yeah, and and, and that's something I, I've seen you know in 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 some of my regular regular day job interactions. It's you know by no means are you telling people hey you're not capable of of using the tools we provide or you know making the technology work. But you know there is a certain amount of uh, you know, working, you know, just kind of working with people that have done it a lot before you kind of avoid yeah. some of the mishaps and, and, yeah. you know, and yeah. once they sort of show you some of the best practices, some of the tips and tricks and things to avoid, you're off and running. Um, but yeah. yeah, far too often you do see people that, uh, you know, it's the equivalent of, uh, you know, Hey, I, I just got this new thing. I just, I threw the manual away and I'm going to figure it out myself. And four hours later, you're still looking for that one weird part. And, uh, <laughs> so you do know how I, you know how I work that. I don't, we've, I, we've, we've all, we've all been there. Out. Yeah. We've all been there. Um, you yeah, mentioned, totally. you mentioned, you mentioned wanting to come back to skilling. What's, uh, what, what does that aspect kind of, you know, kind of involve in terms of, you know, having a unique aspect of, uh, you know, these migrations? Well, yeah, you're kind of hitting on it on the skilling point is let's throw the manual out per se. But uh, it's when I think about the skilling, you, it's new. It's a new paradigm. It's And it's not that scary, um, but it is it's new. And so what we found is and it's a point you hit on is if you can get someone in that's done it and learn with them, then that really just accelerates, accelerates your team's learnings. It accelerates the the migrations and the confidence in it. We've seen, for example, um, actually 
the people dynamic to what we've seen, for example, we dropped our, we have what's called the Azure Fast Track program. This is a program that will come in and help with customers. We'll lean right in or partners if partners that will lean in with them as well. And um, so, you know, we were able to come in with just two of us, uh, two, two folks from the team and, uh, you know, really help that customer, a customer that I'm thinking about here. We had been, they'd been kind of struggling for a couple, I'd say a good month or so we came in and, and worked with them hand in hand and, and showed the showed them how to do how to do the environment with our tools the way we're thinking and we did the entire environment in about two days mm-hmm. and once we showed them how and what was going on bam man they're just off and running yeah. and uh yeah, i need I, ironically i should probably check in with them again just to see how things are going because i've heard of them so and they're and i know that they've migrated and done well on the cloud so um, and that's, I think, the same thing. We just did a, you know, I get that question often is, okay, so we're migrating. How about my team? What do I need to do there? And so some will use partners and, uh, you know, help partners get you moving and others will leverage us and our, ex- you know, the experts we have. And we're willing to lean in with you to, to go in and do that. And we have some programs like the Azure M- Migration Program or our Azure Fast Track to help. Yeah. I, I want to hit on one last topic because I think, um, you know, every, every move to the cloud goes through, you know, kind of different stages. Sometimes you have you have champions wanting to do it. You've got, you know, naysayers, people that, you know, don't want to change. I, I want to I want to dive a little bit into you. You you kind of hit on, you know, sometimes you'll you'll get started on it and you think, OK, am I am I saving cost immediately? Be, you know, maybe at a, you know, cost of compute level. And then you sort of said, well, you know, maybe, maybe that happens, but also sometimes maybe it's just cost savings because you're you're not running things somewhere and you've got less footprint somewhere. Can you talk a little bit about kind of some of the conversations you have with people to help them understand kind of all the economics that go on? Because it is sometimes hard for people to compare, well, you know, in the cloud, we pay for it, you know, maybe on demand, maybe, you know, through through various sort of interesting ways to, to structure contracts versus having done CapEx in the past. Now you're including, you know, yeah. cost of people like kind of, you know, hit a little bit on, on how do you think about that? Because sometimes it's hard to do an apples and apples comparison for people that that don't know all the costs that go into things. Yeah. So the way we the way I typically talk about this and uh, it, it, we it is really. I don't know, first and foremost, and you've heard me hit on it a few times, it's just some resource cleanup, right sizing and optimization. Like So that's your first kind of wave. And. Uh, your second one is really thinking about this natural, and you said a bit of it, natural transition from CapEx to OpEx and what the value brings into CapEx and OpEx. And then just your billing models. Uh, the billing models are very different. You don't yeah. just sign up. You don't pay for a license. You don't have a bunch of hardware that's sitting there. So when you think about, if I go through these three, if I think about the, you know, this initial one I was talking about, which was uh, resource cleanup, right sizing and optimization, you know, that one really just gets you the benefits of, of right sizing the environment. And there's a lot. And I've, you know, in the environments that I ran in my previous roles, uh, boy, there were times I had workloads that were only running 30, 40 percent uh, on the on the environment underneath it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I had to because what if I, you know, when I did have spikes during certain periods or even the holiday season, it was just, geez, how do we. How do we go handle that? And so right sizing, I think, is a big one we see right out of the gate. It's it's good. It's healthy. And I think it helps with some savings there. The, the other one you get is, you know, um, this economy or the economic benefits from, say, that that notion I was talking about, elasticity. And uh, the cloud allows you to just, you know, not keep that extra buffer when you need it. Uh, or, you know, save it so as insurance, it's able to just scale when you need that through the elasticity. The other one that I'll say is um, once you get that, then you just have this natural transition, as I mentioned, to the CapEx to OpEx. And that one is the one we're spending most of the time at right now, which is helping the, the technology teams work back with the CFOs on what does it mean when we shift from uh, – you know, shift from this capital expenditure to an OPEX and what does it mean for optimal cash flow and balance, you know, to help with balance sheet flexibility. These are all things as tech guys or folks were just like, all right, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, We've all been about the technology world, but uh, we've all been focused in, you know, we're all needing to think about this new, new financial side. So we've been doing things to help there. And what happens in this, when you think about the OPEX side of it is, 
over time, those cash flow benefits just start to, they're flexible. You can move your, your finance teams can move these, uh, f- these funds much more across the company. Uh, it maybe it helps reduce the costs, frankly, of what it means to deliver IT in that capital way. And you can apply it back to other more valuable areas for IT and your development teams. Uh, so I think that's that whole shift to OPEX is, is, is pretty key. Um, and that, that also gets us to this pay for what, you know, pay for what you use uh, in there. And then the last one I was talking about is just bi- billing models. Very flexible for Azure billing models. Uh, to be able to get through things like the like reserved instances and spot pricing and hybrid use benefits, where if you've already paid for licenses and uh, on premises, so there's these new billing models that give you more efficiencies and take advantage of that. And the the mix of these three uh, really help, I think, bring a bit more predictability and a bit more visibility into where you're spending. And uh, I think that drives a good conversation back between the tech crews uh, and our CFOs and yeah. the finance departments. Yeah, no, I, that, that's good stuff. And again, it's uh, it's it's never a, a simple thing to sort of move from from one environment to another. But you know, the the more you know, the more you can kind of have a bigger picture of uh, of you know what things are out there and and how do you take advantage of some of the stuff that's that's newer that that helps you, like you said, with spikes with failovers with, uh, you know, scalability that you never could do before is, is always really important. Um, I'm going to wrap up with that. Cause I think we could probably kind of keep going on this for, for a long time. Um, yeah, you know, for folks that are, day. yeah, exactly. So for folks that are curious about all this, what are, what are some of the best ways that if they want to kind of, you know, dig into some of the tools that, uh, that your team drives and, and, and makes available, what are some of the good places for them to go check those out? Yeah, I'd really say there's three key areas that I would focus in on. Uh, when you think about Microsoft, I'd go to uh, Azure Migra- the Azure Migration Center. This is pretty much your one-stop shop that will direct you into those. I'd say look at the Azure Migration and Azure Migrate tools. We've really unified all the tools, so you can go look at that. Second area is don't forget to leverage the Azure Migration program. There's a lot of incentives and teams that we can connect you with including our Azure Fast Track. And our Azure Fast Track team is connected through with a, a ton of experts that are willing to lean in with you on that. And of course we have through the Azure Migration Center, there is a plethora of partners that are there to support you that we're connected with. And uh, look, uh, there's lots of resources to make it easy for you. Yeah, very cool. Jeremy Winter, thank you so much for the time today. We, uh, like, like we always like to tell folks, you know, we, we learn a lot, but we always try and give you kind of a, uh, you know, a framework for, for digging into it deeper. So we will put all those things in the show notes. Um, thank you so much for the time today. We really enjoyed it. Uh, learned a lot. Uh, folks, as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for telling a friend. Thank you for helping us spread the show around and uh, obviously giving us feedback on things like, um, you know, Apple Podcasts and other places where you get your podcasts. So with that, we're going to wrap it up for myself and Aaron. We will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 